Hello and welcome to Old Crescent Rugby TV or OCR TV for short, a video podcast featuring the members, coaches and players of Old Crescent discussing all matters related to rugby. While it is currently not possible to attend or even play rugby matches, Old Crescent has decided to try and fill some of that void for our members by interviewing people connected with the club's past and present. Interactive discussions will be lighthearted, informative, and designed to keep members engaged with the club. Each episode will be broadcast on the club's Facebook and YouTube channels, so if you're not already following us there, you can do so now. Be sure also to follow OC Rugby TV on Twitter, and that's at OC Rugby TV for the latest news on what is upcoming for future episodes on this new and exciting venture. Just, be, just before we uh, get into our first topic of conversation, we'd encourage all our viewers to stay tuned right to the end as we exclusively launch the new club jersey. It's a little bit different, so uh, make sure you all stay with us for that. The guests for our first episode are Old Crescent Director of Rugby, Eugene McGovern, Senior Head Coach, Matt Brown, and Club Captain, Kevin Doyle. Gentlemen, you're all very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about your rugby lives and how you have come to where you are now in terms of Old Crescent. Eugene, we might start from you, or with you even. Your your father, Dermot, he's still on the committee and, and a great club man. He was president in 1995. Uh, with this sort of background, I guess you were born probably clutching a, a rugby ball, were you? Yeah, well, I suppose I actually wasn't. To be honest, I was, I was dragged up to uh, Old Crescent under eights. So back then, we didn't have under six and sevens. There was under eights was the earliest um, we took kids in Crescent. So I was dragged up and I hated every minute of it. Uh, hated every minute of it. But he dragged me up. He, he was a persistent man and he kept me coming up and every week. And sure, look, I, by, by, you know, in a few months, I was, I was loving it, you know. And then I suppose the way it worked then was you you um, up to under 10s and then under 12s it was every two years and then after under 12s then um, there wasn't much of an underage system because the school was so dominant so he we went to school in Crescent and then the next time we came back to Crescent then was um, after you left school so I suppose I came back to Old Crescent then for under 20s um, and then after that, then I kind of, I suppose I stayed with the club for, for a few years, kind of got, was what I was under 20s. When I was 19, I made my, um, my senior debut, um, which, was, which was a great honour for the club, I suppose, you know. But, but even in those, in those years that I wasn't um, playing the club, I still would have been up there every weekend. Because um, as you alluded to there, my father was president in, in 95. And it was a few good years back then. I remember um, so the club would have been thronged with people every every Saturday and 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 even every Sunday because we had a very um, very strong women's team back women's team back then. So they were on Sundays. So um, what was it? Ninety five, ninety six, or, or yeah, ninety six, ninety seven. I think it was. We got promoted um, to the first division. And then again in 2000, and they got promoted to the first division. So there's some good years that I remember when I was, I suppose, growing up with the club, you know, so it was enjoyable yeah. times. And um, were you always going to move into the coaching side of things once you were finished your playing career? Or, or how, did you, how did you plan all that out? No, definitely not. You know, it was, it was something that I suppose I, I fell into, I suppose, you know, it's, you know, there's some things you you don't you don't plan, and, and it's just one thing I didn't plan. Um, uh, I, I had a few barren years when I went MIA over to over to Gary Owen for, for two years, um, but I came back then in, in, in 2009. Um, you know, an enjoyable time over there, um, but I suppose it's not your home club. You know, I won an AIL Munster Senior Cup and um, and an All Ireland Cup, so it was. You know, and have still have friends over there, you know, so it's, it's a great club. But I suppose it's not your home club. And so I came back, I stayed there for two years, came back in 2009. Um, and in 2013 was my my final AIL um, game, I suppose, for the club. And after that, then I think the club was going through a bit of a transition. Um, and I was coming to the end of my career and we had a very strong under-20s team um, coming through. And... 
I suppose it just kind of the club approached me and asked me would I, would, would I um, get involved in senior rugby. So uh, so I did. Um, and, I, you know, I, that, that season I, I worked on getting my coaching badges and, you know, doing, doing a bit more research and I suppose how I want to play the game and how I'd like to kind of run the game or how I kind of, I suppose, portray it to the players and sell it to the players, you know. Mm-hmm. And luckily enough, um, we had... A great group of people that were coming, also coming through the third. So we had a really good twenties team, which Kevin Doyle would have been captain of, I think. Yeah, yeah. And um, we had a really good thirds team, who had great coaching staff, uh, really good people. So a lot of those people kind of, you know, it was good timing. And myself came together at the one time in, in season two thousand fourteen. So that's when I became director of rugby. Um, so you had a lot of really good uh, club players that would have come through the club, the likes of Kevin, the likes of the Monaghans, um, Larry Hanley, the list goes on. Uh, Luke mm. Malone, you know, I'd be here all day. Naming Many the of whom are turning out for the first team these days, right? Exactly, you know, so a lot of, a lot of that under-20s team would be the backbone of the, um, of the team we currently have at the moment. So yeah, so that's, I suppose, that was my kind of first year director of rugby in 2014, which was a learning curve for everyone. Very good. And and I note you're being very humble, Eugene, by not yet mentioning any uh, uh, any of your monster appearances and being part of a Heineken Cup uh, winning squad, but we might come back to that later on when we touch on um, so monster rugby. Uh, Matt, I want to t- turn to you. Um, you were brought up in the hotbed of rugby league country that is Wigan. So tell us how you came to Rugby Union and your journey to where you now are, are now in uh, Old Crescent. Cracky, this could be a long one now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is a rugby league area, but the Rugby Union Club would be quite strong, especially underage. Uh, my father played professional rugby and uh, with the local club. And uh, I think that the truth be told, he had such a bad experience. <laughs> he said, not a cat in hell's chance you're playing rugby league. So straight down to the Rugby Union Club, which is where he started off. And, and sure, I was a bit like Eugene, six-year-old. And um, yeah, I, I was hooked. All my friends were there and I loved it. Yeah, so I went through the, the whole structure there and, you know, I had great aspirations and all this, that and the other, but probably realised early on it, it, it wasn't going to happen. But I was very lucky in a way that I had the chance to go overseas very young at, at 20 to play the game. So uh, I went and did that. Um came back, worked back. To, I, I didn't go back to my home club now because, you know, there was there was a few a few options knocking around and I kind of travelled a bit more around the country. And then I just kind of, I, I kind of just got sick of, of having to, having to work a real job. That's probably due to my lazy nature. <laughs> and I figured I'm young enough now. So at 28, I went off to Australia and I didn't go back to England since now. So What's that? Sixteen years later, I'm, st- I'm still, I'm still bluffing my right way around the world, really. I just stop. Are you sure it's sixteen, now. Matt? Are hey, you sure six- are you sure it's sixteen years? <laughs> well, I've been bluffing Matt? for a lot longer than that. Just overseas <laughs> for sixty. Uh, but no, I, I was lucky enough to play in a few different countries, and um, I ended up in Ireland. Uh, I got a phone call when I was playing in the States, and uh, a fellow just sold. It was a junior club, actually. He sold it to me really well you know just come and play and enjoy I was probably 30 at the time and um, I went to a club called Railway Union in Dublin and they, they play I think they were playing division two in the junior but it was some experience like you know and to be honest part of the deal was that they got me a coaching job in a school and after the first year I, I, w- I was hooked and plus um, yeah I, I, I probably had no business playing anymore at that stage anyway uh, I struggled with the old uh, kick the ball six sixty meters in the in the pouring rain so coaching was a good option for me it seemed a good option for me and then I kind of just stuck at it ever since really and it took me around the country of Ireland as well so which I've been delighted for and um uh, went went through a couple of clubs that was coach, ended up coaching railway and then then out west to Galwegians and then actually Johnny Lacey got me into Glenstall doing the juniors okay which you know was only an hour Galway Limerick's only only about an hour um and then Clan William then after that, which is obviously just out in Tipperary. And then after that, I got I ended up meeting with uh, with an ex-coach, Brendan Gilfoyle, and he, he introduced me to, to Liam Key and we had a chat. They put me on to Goff and I managed to bluff Goff enough to actually take me on. Is uh, Goff or Goff Senior or both? Yeah, and now he's struggling to get rid of me. So <laughs> that's, that's where we are, really. 
that's how I ended up. Plus, obviously, doing the school as well, and and, and that's great. But no, I I love it. I really enjoy it. And you know, it's just there's, there's certainly something that a lot of things obviously went on before I arrived because the way the club is at the moment, it's it's unbelievable. And and again, Goff mm. talked about timing there. I I'd, just timing went really well for me, and and I just think you know. You know, we don't get everything right, but but there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of good stuff going on, and that's probably testament to the fellas who've been there, been there so long. So yeah, very good, it. very good. And and as head coach, and then with Eugene as um, director of rugby, it falls on your heads then to select the club captain each year, or at least have a, a great input into it. So so what goes into making um, the best sort of captain, and why did you choose Kevin Doyle for that? <laughs> Did you want me well, to go? You to <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> Kevin, maybe, maybe we'll we we'll let the lads off. <laughs> maybe Kevin could tell us why he's such a good captain. It's not quite an interview here, Kevin, but uh, no, I would, all right, well, maybe so. I, I, I'm only joking. I'm Are you mad resistance? Spot. <laughs> so, uh, so Kevin, Kevin, you, you've heard from Matt and you've hear, heard from Eugene. There, what's what's what was your old crescent journey? Uh, are you here since you were? A toddler and and and, and most of the part, right? yeah. I suppose, yeah. My grandfather's fa family would have all been involved, you know. You the ring roses, Paddy Lane was a cousin of his, and he was mad into it, loved it. No, no other sport, nothing else, just all presents. So, we were kind of aware of it even before, um, under eights came around. We just knew all presents. My uncle would have played a good bit of seconds at the time back in the old days. And we'd have come out watching him. We'd have come out on the Saturdays. Not that I was even watching matches at that stage. I was just running around trying to squeeze in a fence and then find another gap, another 100 metres around. Can't say I watched too much at that age, but it was just always kind of a part of it, the family, and just you were always conscious of it. And I couldn't wait to get up to under eight. And so the after usual, I couldn't wait to go. And after about two weeks, I was like, Jesus, I am you. You know, I was when I got from McDonough, John Randalls, uh, Neil Darcy, JJ Tool, Tom Ryan. Fellas, a lot of fellas went down and played senior rugby, and they were quite quite a talented group from young age. And I was supposed mm. a bit of a late bloomer coming through, probably not until about 13s or 14s, and I started becoming anyway good at rugby. And um, we had uh, Dave McDonough and Pat Mann, who took no prisoners as coaches as young, young fellas. And it was probably a great grounding to have. And I, I'm up there coaching now at the moment on the Sunday mornings and I find it tough thinking of how to treat us, maybe three kids now is a different kettle of fish. Mm. But um, we came through that underage system, we're quite competitive, eventually got over the line and under the under 16s winning the league and cup double. Uh, uh, um just, just to loop back into what you were saying there, Kevin. How, how you know, and Old Crescent is obviously a club that that encourages and relies a lot on bringing players through from the underage to senior rugby. How many of the team that you came all the way up with are in and around the the senior team now? Now, Jeez, you've Luke Malone, you've Shawnee, you've Paddy, myself, um. Who we got us there now. We had Porrick Quinn, Garrick McDonough obviously moved on. Um, I think about nine of my uh, underage team would have played senior rugby for all present, mm. going through it all, which is quite impressive from a group, from an underage group. Absolutely. And then the stats are even higher then when you go to the twenties. Um, I say we're in the mid-teens of the fellas that I would have played with, even if they just picked up the one or two senior appearances. John was a huge representation there. Fellas like Paul Bogan, kind of who moved on, Mike Cunningham moved on, Kieran Murphy, they all picked up appearances as young fellas. Joe, we were all 19, 20, picking up a handful of appearances for all present. And it was a great buzz to have. And it was yeah. a testament to the team, coached by Joe Nix and Brian Hogan. So we had a great structure at 20s. So we trained about four times a week. We had Eugene doing the weights for us twice a week. We trained on the pitch twice a week, playing matches against the seniors. We are getting 25 to 30 fellas of training every night. And it was a serious setup back then. And uh, it's probably 20s doesn't get the same emphasis, we say, around the country anymore. Or maybe the players just aren't there. But back then, it was hugely popular. It was very enjoyable. And a kind of a classic case of you get out of it, what you put into it. And we had a group of players who 
But in a lot of them, we got a lot out of it. We got a trip to Portugal, which was uh, eventful to say the least, and we had a great time there. And like I said, I fellas from the 20 team, uh, fellas like Kevin Hodnett, who texts me every now and again just to see how we're going and just mm. tell me how much he misses the place, how he'd love to get back to it uh, at some stage in his life. And I told him there's always third rugby from. Uh, you got a good laugh out of that. <laughs> Can I just jump in there? Uh, just jump in there, Paul. Just go ahead, uh, Eugene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A great story about Kevin Hodnett. We were up uh, playing Trinity, and uh, this is when uh, ledges kind of came in, and uh, a lot of guys were wearing ledges. So where ledges would be, you'd put a, a, a foam kind of a, a piece onto your onto your leg, onto your thigh, and you you tape it on. And it's used for lifting, just for the people that wouldn't know it, uh, what it's for. So after the match, anyway, we went in. We played Trinity, and I think Trinity, they beat us. Um, but we were in the dressing room, anyway, a small dressing room. We're all sitting around, anyway. So Kevin, anyway, started taking off his tape. And he was chatting away, as he does. He's a very sociable guy, good guy, and he's a bit of crack. And he was chatting away. So all of a sudden, then, the tape started coming to an end. And he took something out of the tape, and it was actually the what it was actually underneath the tape, it was a Mars bar. As he was chatting away, he opened up the Mars bar and started eating it. And everyone just started, bro- bro- broke down laughing like, because it was just one of the funniest things I've ever seen. He had two <laughs> Mars bars for each ledge and he played the whole game with them on and ate the two of them after the match. <laughs> it's not a myth. It's true story. That's a true, true story, true story. True Absolutely. Story. Excellent. And Eugene, just, just developing what Kevin was saying there, um, bringing the young players through, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much something that Old Crescent ascribes to. Um, we, we want to build from our own underage. We want to produce. We want to provide the kids coming up with, with a, a vehicle to, to aim for. I want to be that boy or girl who's representing the club at, uh, at senior level. How, how important is that to the way you and Matt and the team put together and, and your plans for short-term, medium-term and long-term? Yeah, well, I suppose you asked me there about the whole coaching thing. And I suppose I, with coaching, it, it's coaching a team. It's not just about how the team plays. It's not, you know, I look at it from, I suppose, from a director of rugby point of view, you need to have an overall look. You know, you can't just look at, you know, how did this team play? They play off nine, they kick a lot or whatever. I, I suppose as a director of rugby, I need to look at all the intrinsic details that, that make up a squad, that make up a club you know, and, and how we progress on, you know, and, and, a, mm. and a big thing for me and a big thing that I, um, Kevin mentioned it there, as I was coming to my end of my playing career, I was, you know, I was got into strength conditioning and I got involved with those, that current, that group of, um, with Kevin Doyle. And what I saw with that group was what you can actually do if you put a structure in place that mm. people will buy into structure and they will buy into, you know, buy into all these, you know, you know, all the weights and, and structured sessions and, you know, and, and good feedback and one-on-one meetings, all these small little things that can that can make a team. So I suppose that's the thing that I kind of, kind of you know, big learning curve for me was that group that I kind of spotted that if you put things in place, people will buy in. And if people buy in, you can build something really special. And I suppose that's kind of, you know, where we've come to now and, and it's so important that we have an underage structure that players are coming through and, and they don't, if a player plays and he comes through and he's with the club all his life, he has a bond, yeah. but not ne- that player isn't necessarily going to be a player that's going to play for the senior team. He could coach the senior team. You know, he could be, you know, he could be that guy on the gate picking up the money. He could be that guy in the committee that's going to be there for 20 odd years. He could be the groundsman, you know, so it's, you know, when you're looking at it from that point of view, you need to, you can't be looking at it kind of going, okay, all these players that are coming through the ranks, they're going to play for the senior team because that's just not the case. Mm. So I suppose that, but, but back to what you said there, the underage is massively important. And luckily enough, and, and you know, we have a really good underage structure at the moment. You know, we, our numbers are up around 350 kids all the way from under sixes to, to, to under 18s and a half. So, you know, and we have guys there, we have really good coaching staff. And what we also have at the moment is the senior players would come up on a Sunday and help out. Yeah. So they'd come and they'd link themselves, like take Kevin Doyle there, for instance, he's been up with the under eights for the past six weeks, you know. So all of a sudden there, there's a bond between Kevin and the under eights. 
So they'll build and they, they, they'll, they'll want to come out and watch the matches. And that, that, that feeds into the whole process and making a club, you know, because that's what it's about, a club. It's not just about the, the senior team. Uh, now they are the, the flagship team, but it's, it's so much more about it, you know. And having the underage structure there is it's really key to, to where we're trying to go as a club. Absolutely. And Matt, we, we mentioned earlier on the, the number of girls that are playing underage for Old Crescent now. And Eugene mentioned how strong the team we had, I think it was back in the 90s. And Marie Carroll was, was uh, an Irish international who represented uh, Old Crescent at the time. She's back involved now. And we had the Give It a Try program a couple of months back. And I think we had uh, between 12 and 15 girls attended that. Since then, the numbers have just ballooned, right? I think I counted 46 uh, there last week and somebody, I met a couple of people today and they said there was new girls here today as well. So that's, I, I know you've been involved in, co- in the coaching uh, of the girls as well. I mean, how fantastic is that? Yeah, it's amazing, really. I mean, I just, it's, um, it's a funny one, really, that they, that they kind of, I suppose there's a real big, I think since the Olympic, Olympics and sevens got taken in and women's sevens is part of that, mm. That uh, there's a real focal focal point there for girls to try and achieve, and I know, you know, you're a long way from say under six under six girls to to Olympians, but the fact mm. that they can see there's a pathway there, and then you know the the, the next stage for me and Eugene can jump in here if, if he disagrees, but is is that if after the whole COVID thing, and if those numbers keep increasing, is to put, is to put a team on the pitch, and whatever cycle you've got going in the boys side, you'll you'll end up with the same in the girls. And one thing I'm very strong, uh, very kind of aware of, and, and I think it falls into the the philosophy Eugene's got is the priority has to be the club as a whole, mm. and the club has to survive and 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 keep going. And you know, if you just if you take away the boys and girls aspect, it, it it's club members, it's children that you're getting into the club that are going to be there and they're going to push it on long after we've gone. And I suppose in my job's a little bit different because. You know, realistically, and, and without we're not even joking now. Just you, you could be gone the next year. So if you thought about it like that, you'd be like, "Oh, crikey, I'm like, what am I, what am I at here? I'll just get as many results as I can." But I, I certainly don't think like that, and I think that's probably why I enjoy it so much because I, I don't get that from the club either. And it's very much what you know, what can we do to make things better, whether whether mm-hmm. you're part of it or not, and and if, if you're able to help, and then you, when you whenever you do move on, whenever that may be, and you know, hopefully it's not too soon, but. That the, the place is slightly better than, than than when you arrived, and if you're able to contribute to that, then I think I think you can you can look back with a bit of pride. And, and the girls mm-hmm. is just one arm of that. And I think the sooner those girls start playing games, I think you'll probably, which is you know obviously COVID restricted, you'll see another jump in numbers because once they start playing games, that's the bit that they love the most. Um, and and they're very close to an under 12s full team, I think. So it's great to see. Definitely, that. yeah. Um, Matt, you mentioned COVID, right? And, and and I don't think we could get through this episode without talking about it. Before we get into this discussion of it, I just want to mention a few people who've been very, very helpful during the uh, the crisis. And obviously we know COVID goes beyond rugby and has an impact on society as a whole. But just from our perspective, uh, we had to put a COVID safety plan in place and um, former uh, try scoring winger of ours from the 90s as well. Um, Sean Madigan of, of, of SM Safety, uh, somebody suggested him as a potential club COVID officer and every, every club in the country needed one. And um, I knew Sean from working with him before. I, I rang him up and he didn't hesitate. He just said, absolutely, what what can I do for the club? Um, and Sean has been so helpful um, uh, so far and, and just always in contact with us, helping us out. And it's not just ticking a box. He's... Uh, He's checking us out, right? He's, he's making sure we're doing the right things and so on. And that, that's very important for the safety of all our, our players, both uh, underage and senior. Also want to mention Donald Duggan of uh, DuggenVet.ie. Donald also played for the club in the past and uh, he, he contacted me. He just got directly in contact with the club and, he's, and he supplied us with hand sanitizer and dispensers that his company um, makes um, to help us with our planning for uh, COVID compliance. So again, if anybody out there is in need of, uh, of any COVID uh, uh, supplies, dogandvet.ie, they're based in Tipperary. So please, please do um, support uh, Donald. 
Um, also want to mention John Cleary of Event Master. Uh, John, John is one of our underage coaches and um, he's married to your cousin, Eugene. So it's, it's all in the family here, right? So yeah. jo- John, John run, runs Event Master and he does things like, you know, the Great Limit Run and so on and so forth. But John, John put a fantastic online ticketing system in place for us. I mean, we wanted to, we, want, we, had, we had to, when we were allowed to have people at matches, which was only for a very short time, we had to have a max of, I think it was a 200. And John got a, an online ticketing system up and running for us. We were able to say who had bought a ticket, what their phone number was, so we could contact them for contact tracing if, if that was needed. Well, thankfully it wasn't. But again, John um, and all the team at Eventmaster, uh, thank you very much. Just on, uh, just finally on this, I'd also like to pay tribute to our, our members who stepped up and were very generous and their support at a time when our regular fundraisers were being cancelled left, right and centre. Uh, without all of your help, we could not have kept the show on the road. So thank you to everybody for that. But back to um, back to rugby. Uh, and it was it was before the season. It was kind of three quarters away last through last season. Um, everything got cancelled. Um, how guys has the team and the club coped? Um, because everybody wants to be playing matches, as you, as you mentioned already. Um, so not being able to do that, not being able to coach as much as you normally would, that, that can't have been easy. Eugene? Yeah, it's been quite frustrating, you know, and, and obviously I'm looking from, a, this is just from a Crescent point of view, I'm not even looking at society and stuff like that. You know, obviously yeah. there's you know, massive impact to other people, but I suppose from a club point of view, you know, it's, it's from that level, you know, it's been it's been it's been difficult. You know, um, trying to get a you know a process in place and trying to get you know people to you know it hasn't been difficult to get people to adhere to the the COVID. Mm. You know, the COVID. I suppose the the we have a lot to put in place. Um, the players have been really good. The coach has been really good. You know, but I suppose there has been a lot of um, structures to put in place. And even you know, and it was quite nervy when we went back. You know, uh, you know. Uh, it was very different you know there was no dress rooms there was no social outlet as such yeah. um it was literally arrive um but even before that you know before the players arrived they had to have forms filled out you know so it's you know so even on i remember our first night back training um and we we're all in pods and luckily enough in the club we had four pitches so we could have it structured so um each pod were on a different pitch but we had to stagger the times but i remember um, Sean Madigan said to me, we had a walkthrough on the, the, the Saturday before and, uh, you know, just to kind of see how it would take place, the entry points, the exit points, the sanitizing, all that kind of crack. And he said to me, he says, I might be there Tuesday. And I said, oh, that's grand. Okay, hopefully you won't be there. You know, there won't be, you know, someone sitting on my shoulder kind of looking at me, you know, because I knew it was going to be different. I knew we, we it was going to be a situation where the players are going to arrive and they were going to congregate straight away. So it's it's actually, far more than your job would normally entail, right? Exactly. You know, and it's only natural when the guys are coming out of lockdown, they're going to congregate. They hadn't seen each other in months, six months or whatever time it was. So we arrived up in a way and the first group arrived to the senior pitch and it was pissing rain in a way. You know, and, and the players arrived, they all went down to the pitch and the first thing to do, they all congregated in the dugout. So, and I was just about to turn around and say, right, lads, come on, come on. I looked over my shoulder and Sean Madigan was standing there. And he just took his <laughs> says, we're not two metres apart. So I just said, I turned to him and I was under a bit of pressure. <laughs> I, said, I said nothing to him and, and the red mist came down, but I said nothing. And I just walked away <laughs> and I went over to the lads. I said, right, lads, come on, come on, let's go. So. Like that, that was pretty much after that night. And I think I explained to guys afterwards, you know, you know, we need to be COVID compliant. We need yeah. to, everyone needs to be doing their bit. And to be fair to the players, they're really bought into <laughs> it. And each time the stages kind of relaxed a bit, you know, we, we had a really good understanding. I was very open to the players that, you know, they know exactly what was required from them, you know, and, and they were brilliant, you know, they were brilliant with, with kind of, I suppose, you know, adhering to it, you know, um, yeah. over that time. So it's great to get back yeah. up and run. Yeah. Go on, Kevin. Yeah. Um, you know, we felt like we had great security with the amount of protocols that were in place, you know. Like when we were going out there at the start, I suppose, in the, when I suppose we were first allowed training, we were in the swim lanes and, you know, we were all 
to be in a part, it's, like there was no question amongst the players about concerns then, you know, we knew that these were being, um, structures being implemented, keeping us safe, and there was great confidence in it because we saw the detail that went in and with Sean Madigan and with the sanitizer on and off the pitch and the entrances and exits that you had to use and different times for different groups. It gave, I suppose, without even thinking about it, it gave fellas massive confidence that they weren't going to pick up any COVID or anything like that when we were going out training. And it led to massive numbers at the start of pre-season. I think we had 40 something, we had four different groups at four different times working away, plugging away at the fitness, and there was no rugby to be had at all. And uh, I suppose just testament to the club and everyone involved, the structures that were put in there. Absolutely. And 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 Matt, obviously, we're, we're, we're used to the energy of AIL, we're used to promotion relegation, we're used to competitive matches on an ongoing basis. I mean, there was a there was a bit of a void there, right? Um, and and uh, players are are they're not all the same as well. They're all individuals. Some will have more fears than others. Some will have jobs that are you know very very dependent on them being there. So you know having a fear of catching something like this is is uh, is is very understandable. So when the plans were put in place for the Energy Community Series and the uh, the Monster Senior Cup was going ahead, there must have been a a big sense of relief to get rugby going again. Um, and then obviously we run into another lockdown. So roller coaster of emotions to throw in the cliche. It, it was. Um, yeah, there was, there was good and bad in it. And me and Eugene, prior to the, the when the things were being teased out about what was going to happen, there was a good few discussions about are we, are we going to go in the top group or the bottom yeah. group? And as you know, we, we I, I personally felt... I think deep down, even though I had reservations that the top group was the way to go, Eugene probably, we both probably agreed in the end and said, look, you know, if we want to progress, that's that's the way we go. So we did that. And then obviously the first few games, come like the Senior Cup, you know, we, we did all right. We, we turned cash over, which, was, which has been a while coming. And then the Gary Owen game, we probably were a bit shell-shocked, but we um, we certainly put up a good performance. And, and But for a few mistakes, we, we would have run them close. And then... Um, <laughs> and then it was Cork Con time, so yes. that was always going to be a, a, a tough one. I think after the Cork Con game and after they were shipped against Gary Owen again, and, and me and Eugene have been in contact a good bit now, and we'll be like, "Geez, what? How do we approach this? How do we approach that?" Because it was two hidings, whichever way you look at it. And then Young Munster, and, and that was a hiding for for different reasons to Cork Con. Um, so you, you'd be questioning, it and there's, you know what Limerick's like, and there'd be people saying, "Jesus, who do these fellas think they are?" and what, what have you. Mm. And then UCC, and then oh my God, could it finish? Could it, if it was going to finish? I mean, that was just an incredible performance for for a for a group of uh, you know a group of players giving away um, you know two divisions plus you know with the college team and 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 how much they get to train, albeit they were restricted as well. I just thought it was amazing. So the good part is that we actually finished by getting getting a result down there. Yeah. The, the, the disappointments after that was the fact that. We were really looking forward to having a crack off Shannon, um, and because they'd obviously shipped heavily against the same opposition. Plus, we we, we would have had Cashel, Highfield, um, and and Gary Owen again. You know, so you know the the two the two the two tough ones we got out of the way. You know, and then it was a case of let let's see what we can pick up off the rest. So, yeah, there was good and bad, but I think um, the 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 result against UCC probably justified everything. The fact that you know on our day we, we we can mix it with most teams and look there's certain things where one A clubs have a huge advantage over you but any time we can match in certain areas we're, we're certainly not lacking in rugby so so it was positive from that from that respect um, disappointing then that it goes into lockdown and I suppose the thought that the for me the feeling is just, I just hope we get some rugby before the end of the year uh, and and I, I'd season. be optimistic I think there was so it would yeah. be so. Yeah. So, Kevin, obviously the two lads are involved with the coaching side and I'm on the committee side. So easy for us to say, yep, let's go play Division One clubs. Um, when, when you actually got on the pitch, what was it like? What was the difference between where we normally play, which is 2A? Um, I met you after, I think it was the Gary Owen game and uh, I think it was Darrell O'Brien. You were sore, right? It, it's, it's a big step up. What was it? Any mistake, they're going to score pretty much. You know, we give 
what we felt was a decent enough account of ourselves against Gary Owen, but you make three mistakes against the 1A side and they score three tries. Mm. And that's the difference. You can get away with making a mistake or two in 2A. You, you get punished a certain percentage of times with the level of consistency from 1A. It was just a, a good eye-opener. And I think um, a lot of fellas were a bit worried about doing it at the start. Maybe, you know, it might have been easier to go into that second group. But I think after the first few games, even though we were uh, shipping a few bad results, I think fellas took great confidence from our own ability to play rugby. Whereas we just saw that our mistakes were what was letting uh, these sides into games. And anytime we were getting pressure on them, if we make a stupid mistake, they punish us. And it was, a, it was a great learning curve. And I think all the players took that. There was no one putting their head down thinking, geez, this is yeah. tough every week. We knew that this was a learning curve to go back into play IL um, in a year's time, hopefully. And John Fedda started to enjoy it. And probably very evident against UCC, you know, 19 nil down, I think, and the 19 year old scrum half comes on, scores a wonder try, fellas get a bit of relief. And uh, one of the most enjoyable things ever. I was off for the last five, 10 minutes of it and just couldn't get over how good we were uh, at the end, holding them out. I don't know how many phases it was, but it was a lot. And as I said, I didn't stop shouting for the last 10 minutes. And fellas got, just got massive confidence from it. And there's a great buzz around the club now, even with the amount of fellas coming up helping the underage. And, those results against UCC really helped that you know, positive vibe around the team. And, and th- that's interesting uh, that uh, the two lads mentioned it, Kevin. Um, so no rugby back into lockdown or tier five, whatever we want to call it. And then you have a bunch of senior players who say, who say, you know, I'm not just going to sit in my seat at home. I'm going to go down Sunday morning, help out with the uh, the underage training. Where, where does that come from? Does that come from Eugene and Matt encouraging it, you encouraging it? Does it come from the players themselves? Or I, I presume they're not doing it under duress, right? They're, they're going out and giving up themselves willingly. Yeah, I suppose there's no player made to do it. It's um, yeah. put up a text once a week, see who's available. Um, they get on to me and I send the list to Goff, we set it up. But I suppose there's great transparency between the underage uh, set up and the senior set up and I suppose... Uh, Peter duly involved there can approach Goff and they can chat about it and Goff comes to us then and says that they're just pose it to us um, are you interested and I think we're blessed with a lot of players who came through the underage system in all crescents um, probably a lot more than most other clubs and mm. people are very conscious of giving back to that and I think then we have a great group of fellas who, might, who ne- didn't necessarily come through all crescents but have been here a long time and they buy into that core group of players and so before you know it, they're just one, one of your own and you just assume they've been there their whole lives. And that kind of breeds that um, emphasis to give back to the underage. So it's, it's effortless almost. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 great to see that ethos running through the club. Um, and, you know, th- those, those youngsters who will eventually play in the senior teams, they'll give back again when their turn comes around. So excellent. Look, uh, obviously we hope to get back to rugby as soon as possible. Um, I think we've been given very good guidance from the IRFU and the Munster branch and so on. And, and, you know, they do what they have to do. We'll do what we have to do to get back there. Um, Obviously switching topics a little bit. um, We still have internationals going on. We still have provincial pro 14 matches going on. Um, Have any of you managed to catch up on the Irish um, performances recently, whether against uh, Wales, England or Georgia? Yeah, I, I definitely watched the English game. Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, I presume now that you're one of our own now at this stage, and you were you were waving a, a green yeah, plastic shamrock. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I watched the I watched the England Ireland game. It, it, would you believe my first three four years in the, in Ireland? Um, you know, any time internationals on the, the whole team and, and supporters and stuff, we'd go down the we go down the pub and watch it. And I was the only only English fella there, and it was a time where we were getting beaten nearly every year, and it was so painful and I was just getting flat out abuse in the pub and I was just like oh what is going on here you know you're thinking well we, we surely we'll turn it around in every match no England get done again so no I can't say anything because I know it might come back again but you know it, it is it is quite nice to see England have, get a few results um, the only thing is the Irish press are not quite as harsh as what the English press are if it was the other way around so really uh, interesting yeah geez, and I saw I saw Stephen Jones in the, the Sunday Times today talking about the England power game. Uh, 
Eugene, how, how much is power a part of the game today? Obviously, you can't just rely on power alone. You have to have talented players. And when you see players like Johnny May uh, fluff, going from their own 22, running the length of the pitch to score a try, obviously there's great skill as well. But is, is, is power a huge amount of the top level of the game these days? And is that what you see? Is that why England are as successful as they are? Yeah, I, I think the big thing with England, you know, it's and I think they've been building as well. And, you, you know, it's... You know, everyone, every every team and every club and go through transitions, you know, and mm. I think Ireland are going through a transition at the moment with a new coach and he's, I think he's looking at the bigger picture, you know, he's putting guys in there and he's, you know, he's giving guys a chance now and he's trying to build a squad and he's trying to get new guys in there, you know, and mm. I think England, um, you know, they're, they select um, players, they play a certain type of game. To be honest, I, I think they, they could go 80, 80 minutes they wouldn't care if they had the ball or not, you know, they're, they prefer not to have the ball, you know, and then when they do have the ball, then they, they just give it a go. And, you know, cause they're so powerful that they, they more than likely score because they have guys, fast guys, you know, in, in the backs. But I think they, they base their selection policy on powerful players, you know, that can do a lot of damage in defense, you know, and, and it's, it's a cliche like your defense wins games, but I think, if you have a really, really strong defense and you can't let it, the other team score, you know, it, it's, it's it's simple. You know what I mean? It, it can't score, they can't win. You know, and if you just outplay them from a defensive point of view, you know, and I think that's the way England are just playing. You know, they're just playing defensively, you know, and you, you, you go through their team and, you know, they are really, really effective in defense. I think the something like 250 tackles in the Irish game and they only miss nine, you know, um, that's a massive stat. You know, and, and, and of those tackles that they completed, you know, a lot of them were dominant tackles. They weren't soap tackles. So Ireland couldn't get over the gain line and they couldn't score, you know, and then a few breakaways, you know, it's always going to happen when you're dominant in defence, you're going to create mistakes in the opposition and they just capitalise on that. So, but it is just to answer your question, I think power is a massive, massive part of the game, you know, and if, and if you can have powerful players, it's very hard to play against, which we've, you know, even against Munsters, you know, we they displayed a massive amount of power the day they played us, you know, and they yeah. it made it made us it made it hard for us to actually play the game, to play our expansive game, but we still managed to play it in parts and managed to score a nice try on the day. But for most of the game, they just displayed a massive amount of power, you know, and that's that's I think the one A game. You know, because Corkan were quite powerful in parts as well. They had one or two really, really powerful backs, which got them over the gain line and got them quick ball and, and, and got them into scoring positions. And they, they created scores, you know, so it, it is a massive part of the game. And if you have it, I think it's a serious string to your bow. Absolutely. Matt, Matt Eugene mentioned there... Um, uh, Andy Farrell looking to the long term and, and I, I believe I'm right in saying that these games don't count towards world ranking points so I suppose this is the time to uh, test out different combinations new players and so on and so forth um, w w with that in mind and I suppose Johnny Sexton has, has been injured so we've had to bring in um, a, a couple of other players um, Billy Burns uh, Ross Byrne and so on just, just on that particular um, position we've had world-class players over the last 20 years playing at 10 with Johnny Sexton before him, Ronan O'Gara. Does that, having such a good player in that position, does that cause a problem in itself in that it, it stunts the development of other players coming through? So then when those players are out, it's not as easy to fill that gap. Is it, Are we a victim of our own success at being so strong in that position? Um, there's, there's, there's two sides to that, I think. I mean, the, you would think that the the way the Irish game to me, in my, in, that I see, you know, through the provinces is run is that they try and spread the talent somewhat evenly. And yeah. if there's a shot, like they had a shot, I think the big big issue was prop a few years ago, wasn't it? And they bring fellas in yeah. uh, from overseas or Irish qualified or whatever. But um, so they kind of got to find it a bit of talent. So there's a bit of talent in each uh, in each province in, in each position. Like you've got somebody like Joy Carberry, who you know they've been yeah. very unfortunate. Who for me. Could could easily be the best out of the ones you've just mentioned. He's gone. Um, I think Andy Farrell's right to try Burns out and Ross Burn. I part of me and I haven't I haven't seen him play for Connacht this year, but um, 
I'm surprised Dan Carty let, got left out because from a fellow who's able to actually create something, which to me looks like Ireland is struggling to do, surely he, he would be worth a punt. You know, I, I just, I don't know, like, like you just talked about a power game there and it looks like everybody tried to play a bit of a power game. Mm. But like, if you're going to beat a power game, surely you need a bit of a bit of craft and a bit of flair. And I think one of the best things for me at the Ireland England game, when joking aside, and the result was was actually the try where they chipped over. So you've got that hard mm. running defence coming at you to snuff everything out. So so play the space whether that's a kick or not. So he puts the ball over the top, something that. Jack Carty would also be well able to do. Sorry, I said Dan Carty. Jack Carty would be well able to do. And, you know, th- things like that to mix the attack up. Because if you do something like that to a defence often enough, th- they've no choice but to sit down and, and, and hold off. And then that might create space somewhere else. So I suppose when you're looking at it that way, you need you need a game that can... Um, you, you need areas uh, aspects of your game that can cover all bases so that if one thing's not working, try something else. And and then what's the effect that that ha- that, that that has? You know, the chip over to me. They, they, they got. I'm not sure about the scrum half's coverage, but if they go to that earlier, you might find that the English defence isn't quite as relentless. Uh, going back to what you said about tens, look, I, I don't think the short are talent, but like you know, mm-hmm. a, a ten is probably Johnny Sexton's very good at uh, relieving pressure and managing the game when when the team's on the back foot. Okay. Um, Maybe the other tens are not quite there, but going forward, I don't think they're lacking in talent. Um, I just think maybe the team is not functioning correctly around them just yet. But I, Ireland produce good rugby players, like you know, and they have got they have got footballers. It's just what approach they're going to take to the game, and from from just from hearing you know the rumours and the gossip and stuff, you hear what goes on here and there, and a lot of it's Chinese whispers. But you know, I, I do. It sounds very much like Andy Farrell has a different approach to the game to Joe Schmidt. Uh, as, as as successful as he was, uh, it's going to take time, and you know he's going to find his way a bit and find out what works for the group of players to try and break down a defence like England's or South Africa. The same thing got done to England by South Africa in the World Cup final. You know, it's, yeah, exactly. It's how you it's how you uh, how you fix it and how you approach it. What I would like to see is is somebody kind of think outside the box a bit and maybe throw a bit of caution to the wind, especially in the autumn autumn games. Maybe they're nearly over now, but. Like what have you got to lose? Like just, just try, try a bit of everything. And I think you know people at home watching the TV would would also really appreciate that because you know sometimes when they just when they're just playing kick tennis, it it would be bore you to death half the time. So mm, you'd only love to run the ball a bit. Yeah, exactly. Kevin, did you manage to see any of the Georgia game? Yeah, I watched a bit of it. Um, quite impressed with a few of the players. It was Henderson and Zekerno give quite a good first half something we were probably missing against um, England was just a fellow who can run into another fellow and get you go forward ball from nothing. So I thought Stuart McCluskey, who was a fellow kept out in the dark for a long time, so for a big guy, distributes quite well. And he did today, um, yeah. gives that variance in your attack line that might have helped us against England this small bit. But I think uh, Ireland are creating a lot of chances. They're getting into 22s with line penalties and line outs. But the detail and the line out just seems to be... Uh, Seems to have left them a small bit, and so you know, it's not an easy fix. Like I've been involved in teams, and you know, you're thinking once it creeps in that you're going to lose a line out, it's a mental game. But once they get it right, they go on a run of how many line outs, and it's probably small fixes, but it's just minor details make the biggest effect because they're getting into these positions, but they're not executing just at the right times. One mistake from one person makes them makes the whole line out look terrible, but. Back to what Gaff was alluding with the power game and stuff. Don't think we have the players at the moment to take on in England or South Africa. And I think we revert back to a very simple off nine kind of plan. And it's just feeding into these teams' hands. Like we'll beat teams like Wales that we're actually stronger than, but it won't work against the strongest, stronger teams. So you have to bring in fellas who are going to play a bit more rugby. And you might take a few hits, so maybe lose a bit of game uh, games, but if you can keep that variance in, like Matt was saying, uh, chips over the top, just keep these guys guessing because going half nine against them is a waste of time. 
just play in their hand. Okay, so, so nobody, nobody's too concerned so about the current, current performances. It's about playing the long game, developing players, bringing, making the squad bigger. So excellent, good, all right, all positive on the Irish front. Uh, guys, we're, we're, we're running out of time a little bit, and there's one thing I want to get to, which is um, we have a new jersey. And uh, we have spent quite a lot of money uh, getting a top model to uh, show it off uh, here <laughs> on, on the TV. So oh, after wearing off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is a, an exclusive, uh, not seen anywhere before today. So this is the bra- it's a little bit different, folks. So the traditionalists might take a bit of getting used to it. But uh, thanks first of all to our main sponsor, our new main sponsor, Q3. So Sean Malali and his team. So he's emblazoned on the front, and we also have uh, Takumi Precision as one of our sponsors, and Keen's Jewelers as always. So without further ado, Kevin, do you want to uh, display? Please don't show any flash, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is and if you if you want to just yeah it's a little bit different so it's a nice uh so we ended the stripes just here and yeah. after a solid color the way down yeah. so i was a big i was a big advocate to get the stripes off the hips so um <laughs> it's gonna look good <laughs> and, and what about the back is it, is it something similar in the back kev so it keens there on the back yeah. Excellent. And where's where's and we have uh, Energy AIL, I think on that side, and Takumi on the other side, right? Yeah. Do you want to make sure all our, our sponsors uh, get a mention? So excellent. Um, so looking forward to actually playing a rugby match in them. So hopefully that will be um, uh, happening before too long. Uh, so gents, listen, we've just about run out of time. I'd like to thank you all for giving of yourselves today. And I know that our members and supporters will be very appreciative of your making the effort to fill the rugby void. To you at home, uh, if you've enjoyed this video podcast, or even if you haven't, please give us your feedback by leaving a comment on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or on Twitter at OCRTV. Thanks for your time, and we'll see you again soon.